Well, I want to bring a message today from, uh, from the book of Acts, and I want to ask a question. How many of you have ever been to a prayer meeting? Anybody? How many of you? Raise your hands. I've been to pra- any kind of a prayer meeting. It could be, you know, a half a dozen people in uh, somebody's house or, uh, you know, 500 people in a, in a church building or whatever, but a prayer meeting. Now, just the name of prayer meeting just kind of indicates that it is a meeting for the purpose of prayer. That's pretty complicated, isn't it? (laughs) It didn't take me long to figure that one out. It's a meeting for the purpose of prayer. Now, you might sing a little bit. You might worship a little bit. But the main focus is prayer. You might share something from the Word of God to encourage the praying. But the main purpose of that is prayer. Now, when I was a, when I was a kid, uh, we had church all the time back in Missouri. I mean, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Somebody said the other day, I think we ought to have Sunday night services again. Well, I don't know. I, you know, I'm almost 72 years old now. I don't know how many times I can go to church on Sunday. But Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you had prayer at the church. You had service at the church. Friday night was youth group <laughs> when we weren't going out to the Friday night football game. And uh, then we also had these little uh, cottage prayer meetings. Anybody ever heard of that? Some of you have been around a long time like me. You've heard of cottage prayer meetings. That's where a group of people gather in a home. They encourage one another. They share something from the Word of God, and they pray. And they pray about needs and, and uh, prayer requests and that kind of thing. And uh, I was never too excited about that when I was a kid. I just wanted to get home and watch TV, you know. Uh, when we finally got TV, I think I was eight or nine before we even got television at our house. But a prayer meeting. Through the years, I've been to prayer meetings in different parts of the world. I've been to prayer meetings with thousands of people, kind of like what we're going to do down in D.C. I've been in prayer meetings with uh, six, seven, or eight people. I remember when Loretta and I were pastoring in Illinois, where Pastor Brad is from, we had a a Korean lady came and uh, they moved into the community. So she came to our church one Sunday and we had a, we had a good church, you know, I don't know, 400, 450 people every Sunday morning. And uh, uh, we had lots of activity to go, going on and we did have prayer meeting. But this lady from South Korea, she, she came to me the first Sunday she was there. And you know what she asked me? Not about when the pizza party is, not about when is the women's group going to get together and all, you know, all these other kinds. She said, where is the 5 a.m. prayer meeting? And I said, uh, because I knew about the Koreans because ever since Dr. David Young E. Cho came to Jesus and raised up the largest church in the world in Seoul, South Korea, they've had prayer meetings at 5 o'clock in the morning in South Korea. They even have a prayer mountain. And at 5, 5 a.m. every morning, hundreds, maybe thousands, ascend that mountain and pray. They're still doing it. So whenever a Korean comes in your midst, they always want to know, where's the 5 o'clock prayer meeting? And we're not talking about evening. We're talking about in the morning. I said, well, uh, there won't be anybody here tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock. But our staff comes in and we pray together at 8 because we did. We would pray together in the sanctuary separately and then together before even having staff meetings. But prayer means a lot of different things to different people. And we've heard pastor talking about it over these last few weeks. So what I want to do is I want to take you back into church history, what it was like for the first Christians. They didn't have buildings like what we have. They, uh, they didn't have uh, uh, electronic devices to remind people, hey, prayer meeting tonight at 7 uh, they didn't have anything like that. And uh, they were under persecution. They didn't even have a printed Bible. All they knew from the Word of God was what they heard and the scrolls that were still in the hands of the Jewish rabbis of the Old Testament. And so, but one of the first things that they did was they started gathering together to pray. So what I want to talk about today is the power of, of praying together or the power of corporate prayer, the need for corporate prayer, the power of praying together. Pastor Loretta was sharing her testimony this morning trying to encourage us in a prayer against fear, 
A lot of people are afraid right now. And if you watch the news all the time, you'd be afraid too, you know. Sometimes we have to turn it off. It just gets to be too much. Sometimes some of that stuff, all those messages flowing into my, my phone, my electronic device, sometimes I have to turn it off and say, God, is there any peace anywhere? Please, I need peace. You can, you can see what's happening. And so she was trying to lead us together corporately and even those who are watching at home in a prayer of resisting fear and seeking for the, the victory and the peace of God. So we're going to go to Acts chapter 1, and here's how we're going to do it. We're going to, we're going to read a, just a portion of about four places in Acts, because I want you to get this picture, okay? Acts chapter 1, verse 14 says, and I'm reading it in, uh, uh, in the NIV. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. They all joined together, that's a key word, constantly in prayer. They agreed that they were in this for good, the, new te the uh, NLT says. They agreed they were in this for good, completely together in prayer. Now, go to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. That's the next chapter over, so you should be right there. Verse 1, they were all together and in one place. Now go to chapter 4, only, three, only two chapters over from there, and verse 24. Chapter 4, verse 24. They raised their voices together in prayer to God. And one more place. We're going to skip over. A few months later, Acts chapter 12 and verses 5 and 12. Acts 12, verse 5, and then up to verse 12. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. And verse 12, there's a phrase in verse 12. Many people had gathered and were praying. The key words in all of these is together and prayer. Together and prayer. All right? Now let's look at the first one. Back to Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Jesus had ascended to the Father in heaven, and he told his disciples, go back to Jerusalem and wait. They're ready to preach the gospel around the world, but he says, go and wait. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. So in verse 14 of Acts chapter 1, we see that they made their way to, into the city of Jerusalem. It's, it's time for the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost was considered the early harvest, the feast of the first harvest, Pentecost was, 50 days after Passover. That was the weekend, you know, those the time of Passover celebration when Christ was crucified and rose from the dead. And so 50 days later comes Pentecost. And so everybody goes to Jerusalem at Pentecost. The city is full of people at Pentecost. Matter of fact, people come, Jewish believers come from all parts of the Roman Empire, all parts of the world to Jerusalem at that time. So it's packed with people. You can't get a hotel anywhere. You can hardly get a meal in a restaurant, right? It's because there's so many people who are there in Jerusalem. And so they were in a house in an upper room, and they were praying together. And the group is no longer 12, but there are 120. And for 10 days, they have been praying and fasting, just as Jesus said, waiting for the promise of the Father. They were praying. Now, what I like about it is what it says they all joined together. There was a sense of commitment. There was a sense of, I'm here because I want to be here. There was a sense that I'm here because I'm committed to be here. Every time we pray, I'm committed. I will pray. Hallelujah. There's something about commitment in the body of Christ where we say to one another, if you need prayer, I'm with you. If you need to pray through, I'm with you. If there's a prayer meeting and we're praying about needs, I will be there. I'm committed. I'm joining together. Now, what we're talking about is looking at what happened 
when people join together in prayer. There's a power that comes. And so they were joined together. They were in prayer. There was a feeling of agreement that we will stay here. We will wait until the promise of the Father. So they were in agreement. In Matthew chapter 18, you remember what Jesus said. He said, we're to agree on anything. I, I will give it to you. It will be done to my Father in heaven. Where two or three agree. He's talking about the spirit of agreement. And it says in, in, in the, in the uh, New Living Translation in Acts 1, it says that they agreed. They agreed to come together. There, there, there's an Old Testament saying in, in uh, Amos. It's in the book of Amos, and I, it, it just, it's just a real common sense thing. It says, can two walk together unless they agree? So you get a picture of two guys who decide, hey, we're going to take a trip together. And one guy says, well, I'm going to go this way. And the other guy said, well, I'm, I'm going to go this way. Like, wait a minute. We can't go together if you're going that way and, and if I'm going this way. So they at least have to do, uh, agree together to go in the same direction or, or they're not together. Come on. That, that's just basic stuff, isn't it? Common sense. So Amos said, two cannot walk together unless they agree to walk together unless they agree to go to the same direction. And so what happened in Acts chapter 1, it says they agreed. They were agreeing. They joined together in prayer. It was a 10-day upper room prayer meeting. I've been to that place. You know, it was kind of funny because we were a Pentecostal group when we were there. I put together a group back in 1990. We had 40 people. We went to the Holy Land. We went to this place on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And they said, well, this may not have been the exact upper room, but we think it could have been, and it would have been a place like this. So we're up there, and we're starting to sing. Everywhere we went to the holy sites, we would sing, and then we would pray, and somebody would read the Word. So we had our Bibles open. We, you travel through the Holy Land, which they call the land of the book, with your Bible open, and that's what we did. So we're at the place of the upper room where the Spirit of God fell on the day of Pentecost, and uh, we're beginning to worship. And so Jacob Tumari, he's our guide. He's a Jew. He comes over me, whispers in my ear. He says, Michael, tell him to speak in tongues. This is where you speak in tongues. I said, oh, okay, Jacob. I said, you know about that? Oh, yeah, I know all about it. I think Jacob was probably a closet Christian, but if he would confess confessed Jesus, he would have lost his job at a tour guide. He said, tell them to pray in tongues. This is a place where, we, where they pray in tongues. For 10 days, they prayed and they fasted and they waited for the Holy Spirit to come. And then Acts 2, that's the next place we want to go to. Acts 2, verse 1. And it says, when the day of Pentecost had arrived, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together. Can you say that word with me out loud? Together. Can we say it again? Together. You know we're stronger together than we are apart. You know that? We're stronger together than we are apart. Loretta was talking about her, her illness when she was so paralyzed by fear. It's a good thing she had a loving husband with her, right? I, and she's done the same thing for me because we're stronger together than we are apart. In the body of Christ, we're stronger together. What happens when we get separated from the body? What happens when we get out here and we get out in too much of the world and we've not been around the body of Christ, we've not been active, we've not been doing things, and I worry about people who are in that state right now. You know what happens? It's like a bunch of sheep. And we are sheep. Jesus said we're sheep. The church is a bunch of sheep. That's what we are. And sheep are not easy animals to take care of, let me tell you. But what happens when one gets away from the flock and he's not together with a group and he's out here somewhere? He is prey for a wolf or a coyote. I've been out in Wyoming and I've seen the coyotes howling and I've watched the herds of sheep down around Devil's Tower in eastern Wyoming. I've seen what that's like. It's a, it's a harrowing thing, man. When you hear, it's weird when you hear those coyotes begin to howl about the middle of night and you just go off to sleep and all of a sudden in the darkness you hear those coyotes howling. Well, when the sheep gets separated 
from the togetherness of the sheepfold of the flock, he's, he's, more, he's out there on his own. He's isolated, and he's prey for the coyotes or for the wolves. So they gathered together. They were in one place. If, if you read it in, uh, the, in the King James Bible or as well as in the, uh, uh, I think in the King James Bible, it says they were in one place and they were with one accord, which means they were in the same place. They were in agreement. And what happened? There was a rushing mighty wind that came through the building. Wow. And cloven tongues of fire came from heaven and sat upon every one of them. And suddenly they began speaking in all of these other languages. When the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, he didn't come to a conference. He didn't come to a group of, 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 of tacticians uh, in ministry. He didn't come to a group of theologians. He came to a prayer meeting. Did you get that? When the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost, he came to a prayer meeting. And they were all together. They were together in one place, and they were praying together. And they were in agreement together. They were walking together. They were praying together when the Holy Spirit came. Came to a prayer meet. When uh, some, some of you may have heard in the past, I've mentioned a time of revival in one of our churches back in Illinois where we were pastoring before we left to become missionaries. God sent revival into our church. And every revival movement there's ever been throughout history in the Christian church has been preempted by prayer meetings. It doesn't begin with great preaching. It doesn't begin with great singing. It doesn't begin with, with wonderful, powerful worship, with smoke and lights. It begins as a prayer movement. Every great revival movement in history, in history of the Christian church over the last 2,000 years started as a prayer movement, not as a preaching event, but as a prayer movement, as God's people got on their faces and sought the Lord and repented of their sins. That's how it starts. And when God brought great revival to our church in 1996, we started a Tuesday night prayer meeting, and we had maybe 25 people. Not long. It wasn't very long until Tuesday night grew to 30 and 40 and 50. And after a while, we were having 100 people every Tuesday night in prayer meeting, 100 people in a church of 400. That, that's 25% of the congregation. And we were praying every Tuesday night. And you know what happened? On Tuesday night in those prayer meetings, people were baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. In Tuesday night in the prayer meetings, we had healings. We had divine healings taking place. And we did our best to pray for an hour when we first started. But after a while, we would pray for three hours. He said, Pastor, how long? That would wear me out. No, when you're in the Spirit of God, when miracles are happening, when the presence of the Holy Spirit is there and a fire of God is falling, the time doesn't mean anything because you're just being filled up in the power of the Holy Spirit and God is at work. And it started in the prayer meeting. It didn't start in the Sunday service. There were people in the Sunday service who came. They were guests. They were visitors. Some were not even followers of Christ. And there were many people who come who were uncommitted. But the group that prayed on Tuesday night, they saw the power of God fall, and they said, I want to be a part of that. I wanted to gather together with my brothers and sisters in the Lord. And if you've heard me tell that story about the revival, kids took the revival to the high school. And one of the, the, vice, president, the vice principal of the high school said, uh, when the kids went to him, said, we need a room to pray at 7 o'clock in the morning before school starts. He said, I'll give you a room, but you've got to have a teacher there. So they had a teacher. Kids gathered to pray. They'd read the Word and pray. Just student-led, just a bunch of high school kids from our church and some other churches around that got started. But they filled up the room, and the vice principal says, I'm going to give you the auditorium to pray in at 7 o'clock in the morning. And then it started at the junior high school. Same kind of thing happened. Listen, revivals don't begin because somebody announces and said, hey, Next Sunday, we're having a revival here at our church. Oh, really? You might be having revival meetings, but that doesn't mean you're going to have real 
heartfelt revival. It doesn't happen because we have an event where we say, we've got a famous preacher coming to town, and for sure we're going to have revival. But revival movements begin as prayer movements. And the power of the Holy Spirit came to a prayer meeting. And from there it sent them out. That day, 3,000 people in Jerusalem became followers of Jesus Christ. Wow. Amazing, isn't it? Chapter 4. We go to chapter 4 of Acts. It's about 60 days after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, somewhere around 60 to 70 days, so a little bit, you know, around two months. It's about a week or two after Pentecost when that great revival came on the day of Pentecost. Peter and John had been going up to the temple to pray, they met a man who, who couldn't walk. Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. Took his hand, raised him up, and the man walked. But not only did he walk, he started running and jumping and leaping in the temple in front of everybody. And it caused such a ruckus in the city because it was all done in the name of Jesus that the religious crowd the Jews, the Pharisees, the, uh, uh, the Sanhedrin, they decided, hey, we got to stop this thing. So let's get Peter and John, they're the leaders of this whole thing, bring them in and threaten them no longer to preach in the name of Jesus. All right? So because they were the leaders, they said, if we could just get them to stop, maybe everyone else will stop. We won't hear there uh, we won't hear the name of Jesus again. And then we get down to verse 23. It says, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported to them all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together to God. You know what happened in that prayer meeting? They began to pray. And the first thing they did was they started praising God. And then as they praised God, then they said, And Lord, would you give us boldness to go back out there and to declare your word again on the streets of Jerusalem? Look at verse 30 of Acts 4. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through your name. And then it says in verse 31, And after they prayed, after they prayed, not before, not during, but after they prayed, the Bible says that the place where they were was shaken. Visibly, the physical building began to shake where they were praying. And the Bible says that they were all refilled with the Holy Spirit and went back out and spoke the Word of God boldly. You know, they could have said, well, we better stop meeting like this, you know? We, we stirred up a lot of trouble in town. Maybe we, we just need to go under the radar for a while. No. They said, God, you're the great God. You're the one. You're the one who saved us. You're the one who's called us. Now, Lord, give us boldness to go back out and preach again on the streets of Jerusalem. They could have said, well, you know, we should probably do what they told us to do, you know. We've got some churches right now that are resisting being shut down in some parts of our country, and they're resisting it. They're resisting the local government declaring freedom of worship and freedom of, freedom of religion. And, and, you know, they're, they're taking a stand. You know, sometimes you have to take a stand. Now, you have to be careful. You have to have social distancing. Everybody I see in here is wearing a mask. We've got hand sanitizer out there. We're trying to be careful. We don't touch. We don't, we don't hug. I miss those hugs. I miss the, the touches. I miss the shaking of the hands. We have to be very careful. But at the same time, I wonder if there's not a subverted reason for all of this to put the quietus on the church. You know what I mean? And they didn't say, now, Lord, we, 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 listen, guys, we should probably do, we should probably stop these prayer meetings. We, we, we don't need to be coming like this. Uh, Peter, listen, you know, next time you see a crippled man, please don't heal him. 
Really? Really? Uh, John, listen, the next time a crowd gathers around, man, don't, don't preach in the name of Jesus. You just stir up trouble, and the next thing you know, they're going to put all of us in jail. Really? Is that what they said? No, they gathered together and they prayed and they said, Lord, why did the heathens rage? Why did the nations rage? The kings of the earth have taken their stand and their rulers together against the Lord and against his anointed one. But then they, they began to praise God and they said, Lord, stretch out your hand, send signs and wonders. We want to see more people get healed. We want to see more people transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And they went back out and declared the word of God with boldness. Wow, what a powerful prayer meeting. What a powerful prayer. You know what? We haven't seen an organized conference yet. We've just seen prayer meetings. Crowds gather outside. Somebody preaches. No sound systems, no worship teams. We haven't said, oh, oh, we need to form a denomination, guys. We, we, we got to get ourselves. I, I know there's a. There's a reason for organization. I understand that. And they eventually had to do that. But it was prayer meetings. Let's pray. They're threatening us. They're telling us to shut up. Don't preach in the name of Jesus. You can't do that here. So let's go pray. Let's ask God. Let's glorify the Lord. And all of a sudden there was something about it that rose up within. Oh, no, no, no. We're, we're going to ask God for boldness. We're going back out. We're going to preach again. And it got them in trouble again. And you go to Acts chapter 12, you find out that Peter was thrown in jail. Matter of fact, Herod, the king, <clears throat> he was the, the Jewish king. Herod, the Jewish king, had James, the brother of John, killed. He had him, he had him put to death. And so he got Peter because Peter was one of the leaders there in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 12, and put him into prison. And I like what it says in Acts 12. Read it along with me. It says, um, it says verse 5, So Peter was kept in prison. And it, what's the next word in your Bible there? But the church was praying. Don't you like that? Peter was in prison, but, however, the church was earnestly praying for him. Wow. So what happened? It says the church was praying. So what happened then? In the middle of the night, an angel came to Peter and he said, Peter, I'm going to set you free. Took off the shackles, took off the chains, his handcuffs, whatever they were. Somehow he put all the guards to sleep. Nobody knew what was going on. He said, get your coat, follow me. Peter got up, put his coat on. The angel opened the gates of the prison, walked out, said, follow me. Come on, we're getting out of here. So Peter's walking down the street, and he's thinking, wow, this is amazing. I, I need to go tell my brothers and sisters, where would they be? Oh, I bet they're over at Mark's house. So he goes to this house, verse 12. Look at verse 12 of, of, of Acts chapter 12. And so when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary and John, also called Mark. So it's John Mark where many people had gathered and were praying. Didn't say they were having a worship service. Didn't say we were having a conference on how to release people from prison. Didn't say that, did it? It says that when he got there, people were praying. Many of them, believers, had gathered together in one place in prayer. Now, i tell you what I believe when we gather together and we pray for those who are in prison in Baltimore, we can miraculously see God release them from their prison. So what are you talking about, breaking the law? No, I'm talking about the prison of addiction, of alcoholism, of prostitution, of human trafficking. That's one of the biggest problems we have now in America, and it's going on right here in the Baltimore area. In every major city in America, Kids from the, as young as 9 or 10 years old are being prostituted every day as sex slaves. Sometimes as many as 30 times a day. I think the church ought to get together and pray, God set them free from that prison. What about you? 
abortions, all the things that are happening in our world today, all the addictions, all of the things that drag people down, all of the things that have captivated men and women and even children and have completely controlled them. But when the church gets together to pray, when we pray, hallelujah, together in one place, joining our hearts and agreeing together, if somebody says, pray for my son, he's lost, he's a prodigal son, and if someone else says, I'll pray with you, and if another person says, I'll pray with you, and somebody else says, come on, let's pray together, let's agree for your son to be set free. There's power in that prayer. And you know what happened? Peter got to the, got to the gate, and he, and he knocked on the gate. Hey, 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 anybody there? It's Peter. So Rhoda, a servant girl, she goes to the gate, and she looks at him, and she says, who is it? He says, Peter. And she looks, and says, oh, my God, it is you. But it's not you. It's a ghost. She runs back inside of the prayer meeting. The ghost of Peter is outside. Now, they've been praying for Peter's release, but when it actually happened, they couldn't hardly believe it. They ran outside. There was Peter, and then they celebrated together. Wow. It wasn't a conference on how to get people out of prison. It was a prayer meeting where they were gathered together in prayer, and it released Peter from prison. Wow. Now that's revival, and it's revival that starts in a prayer meeting. So here's how I look at a prayer meeting. I look at a prayer meeting as what I would call faith multiplied, where one person says, I'll agree with you, another person says, I'll agree with you, and then there's a whole group that says, we'll agree with you to pray for the release of your son or your daughter or your friend or your neighbor or your husband or your wife. And then one after another. You say, what, what do you mean faith multiplied? Remember the Bible where it talks about f five will put a hundred enemies to flight, but then a hundred will put 10,000 to flight. Well, five times 20 is a hundred. But five times 100 is only 500, not 10,000. You see the ratio? How it changes? The more people involved, the more power there is to bring about a victory. You see that? You remember what Loretta read today from Psalm 91? That's the great victory chapter of the, of the Old Testament, I believe. It says that a thousand will fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it will never happen to you. You're going to be victorious. Wow, look how God multiplies these things. Look at the armies of heaven that are fighting for us and with us. And when God's people agree together in prayer, there is nothing impossible. There is no miracle that's out of reach when God's people get together and pray. I remember as we were, uh, we were celebrating, uh, <clears throat> we were celebrating the 75th anniversary of, of the church that we pastored in Illinois and so we went back to the, to the old church where the church first started, and it was now a black congregation, Church of God in Christ. And uh, we had a wonderful, wonderful fellowship with that pastor in that church. And, and uh, they, they were in, in, in all black area of, uh, of the East St. Louis area. And, uh, and, and the pastor was, became a friend of mine, and, and we went down to their church, and then they came up to our church, and they sang and preached, and man, we, we had ourselves a time. We really did. Even though ours was a mixed congregation, theirs was an, uh, was an all-black congregation. But I remember we went back on a Sunday afternoon, and we had a service in this little church, and it probably, uh, it was not as big as this. It was probably half as big as this, and might have seated uh, maybe 125 people in that, in that old church building. They built it with used lumber in the 1920s. Isn't that amazing? And uh, they dug out the basement. It had a basement under it. They dug it out with, with horses uh, and mules working together to dig out that basement and built a building with used lumber. And we had, a, we had one of our uh, honorary deacons. He was uh, in his 80s. I'm, I'm getting close to that now <laughs> one of these days. And he was in his 80s. 
his name was Messer, so we called him Brother Messer. He worked in, uh, in a steel mill for many years and, and retired from the steel mill. And he, and he loved God, but he's a little short fella. He's kind of bald-headed. It, what was the guy in the comic strip? We used to talk about how he looked like the guy in the comic strip shooting the rabbit. Remember that one? The, the bald one? Yeah, or, or Magoo or something. Yeah. Anyway, we, uh, we had a worship time, and then we had an opportunity for um, people to share testimonies about being there in the old church in the beginning. What was it like? Because we had young people with us. The building was packed out that Sunday afternoon. And uh, I wanted those young people to hear the stories of the older people. Now, us older folks, we've got stories to tell. But we've got some powerful testimonies to share as well. We've been down this road. We've seen a lot of stuff. We've seen God at work. We've seen lives change. We've seen miracles. And we were in a time of revival. We saw miracles happening. One couple came on a Sunday night. And they, uh, the boy had grown up in the church. The, the girl was from another church. And they were... Uh, they, they had just gotten married. They were looking forward to having, having children. And they, they found a tumor on her uterus that was as big as a grapefruit. And the doctor had told her, said, you're going to have to, you're, you're going to, have, to have surgery. We've found this tumor on your uterus, and, and we can't guarantee that you'll ever be able to have children. Now, I don't know about all, all, all of the details because I'm, I'm, I'm not a medical person. But, I mean, these kids' heart were breaking. They'd been married about six months. They wanted to have babies, and they found this tumor. And they, What's that? They were going to do a hysterectomy. That's what it was because it, it was so bad, and they were worried about her uh, with cancer. And uh, they were devastated. Came to church on a Sunday night. We were in revival. People had been healed. The first prayer meeting, five people were healed back in January. It was amazing. It was amazing. And on Sunday night, they came and prayed together, broken. Their hearts just poured out before the Lord. On Tuesday, they were getting, they were getting her ready. She showed up at the hospital on Tuesday morning for the surgery. And she said, Doctor, I know this is unusual. But she said, M- my heart is breaking. She said, I, I just, I feel like there's been a change. Would you please do one more check? Now, I don't know if it was a... Uh, it was a sonogram or what, whatever the test was. But she said, before this surgery today, will you check once more at the size of that tumor? And the doctor finally agreed. He said, this is unusual, but I'll do it. And so they took her in. They did the test. Sometime later, the doctor came, came back and he said, you're not going to believe this. There is no tumor. There's nothing wrong. It's gone. He said, I saw it last week, but he said, it's no longer there. You don't need surgery. Get dressed and go home (laughs) and have a family. Isn't that amazing? We were seeing things like that happen. No, Brother Messer, he got up and he walked down in front of the altar that Sunday afternoon. He said, well, he said, it was a long time ago. He said, I'm going to tell you what happened here at this altar one Sunday night. He said, a man walked into our church. He was a part of one of the families, said he had a brain tumor. And he said, on that Sunday night at this altar, he was pointing to that old altar in that little church. He said, on that Sunday night, God healed that man of a brain tumor. Wow. Of course, we had Holy Ghost pandemonium. We began to shout and praise the Lord. It was true. The man was absolutely healed instantly on that Sunday night around that altar. I'm going to tell you something. There is power in in prayer. There is power in agreement. You know, what it says in the Bible, it says uh, uh, in Deuteronomy, it says that 
one will put a thousand to flight, but two will put ten thousand to flight. It's multiplying. It's more faith. It's faith that's being multiplied. I can pray alone. I can see miracles alone. But when I got somebody else saying, I'll pray with you. When I got somebody over here saying, I'll pray with you. When I got somebody else saying, hey, let's pray together. Let's get a group together. Let's call on heaven together. Let's put our faith together. And faith is multiplied in that room that God can work and do something powerful. There is power when we pray together. And I know people say, well, I pray at home. Well, you need to pray at home. I pray at home. Everybody needs to have personal prayer life. But there's a time when the church must be coming together and praying together. In the Old Testament, it's full in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers, in all of those places in where God's people didn't know what their future was, but it says that God called a sacred assembly. And he didn't just call the preachers or the leaders of the tribes. He called the whole nation of Israel together. Can you imagine a million and a half people bowing on their knees in the wilderness and praying to God at one time together? Wow, no wonder the fire of God was in the tabernacle and the cloud by day that guided them through the wilderness because they, their faith was multiplied. Their belief in God was multiplied. It, like it says on the day of Pentecost, they were together. They were in one place. And I know what's happened to us with this whole pandemic. You know, some of us are worshiping at home. Some of us are praying at home. For a while, we were teaching Bible studies by Zoom. And I know that you can do that. And, and I don't know what the pandemic holds for us. And I've heard people through the years say, well, pastor, you know, I can worship God anywhere. I don't have to come to church every Sunday. Well, I suppose you can. When I walk in the woods, I worship God in nature. I worship God in our home when we have family devotion. I lift my hands and we start singing, oh, Lord, I'm worshiping God in my home. But that's not the same as when we gather together as the church, the body of Christ. Paul said to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 1, he says, I want that you would agree together. You're the body of Christ. You're knit together. You're fit together. You need each other. And not only do we need to worship together, we need to pray together. So when a pastor says, we're having a prayer meeting, we can do that on Wednesday night. We're coming together. We're going to pray. We're going to agree. Why do we do that? Because the Bible says there's power in agreement. The Bible says one puts 1,000 to flight, but two puts 10,000 enemies to flight. Faith is multiplied. We're encouraged by each other. We're encouraged by each other's presence. Amen. At 1030 this morning, I didn't know there were going to be 10 people here, but look at you. Praise God. Thank you for coming. You've encouraged me. Hallelujah. It's more fun to preach to 50 people than 10. Amen. Amen. So when we come together, this whole COVID-19 thing has, has divided us and separated us, not, not spiritually, but, you know, it's keeping us away from one another. But don't let it keep you from the house of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. In recent months, there have been... Uh, Numerous church leaders and, and pastors and missionaries and uh, evangelists all across the country and all across the world have been calling God's people together for prayer because we see that we're in a very, very difficult time. <clears throat> in, um, in the news this week, something happened, and I don't know if, it, it probably didn't make page one of all the major newspapers, but I did re read about it in uh, CBN. I have the CBN News app on my, uh, on my phone, so you get with CBN News, you get the Christian perspective. Russia and Iran have just formed a new alliance along with Turkey. You ever read the book of Ezekiel? You ever hear the name Gog and Magog? The tribes that are to the north. One is the larger, the larger force, the larger nation, the larger army. The other one is the smaller one. But the smaller one reaches in with a hook and has a way of 
forming an alliance and bringing the big one together with them. And together they head for Jerusalem and Israel. Well, that happened this week, my friends. There's a, an alliance that's forming Russia, Iran, and Turkey. I don't know if you realize it, but Turkey just recently um, changed the designation of what used to be the biggest church in the world. Now it's the biggest mosque in the world, and it's upset people all around the world. But it's all a part of the last days. We're living in the last days, folks. The rapture of the church is coming soon, soon. You get that? Don't fall asleep in the house of God. Man, don't, don't be slumbering in the house of God. And here, here's a scripture that we've used a lot to batter people. I mean, we've practically taken our five-pound Bibles and hit them over the head with Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, as is the case with some, all right? Because you'll have need of doing that. I forgot what it says exactly. All the more as you see the day approaching. You want to read it? Let's look at there real quick. This will be my last one. Hebrews 10, verse 25. We have used this to try to pound people into coming to church. You know what I mean? It, it's like, okay, that's what the Bible says. You need to go. You need to go. Well, <laughs> if they don't want to come, we can't force them to come, right? But I want to use this, and there's a reason for it. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. It is, a, it is a real thing. It is a real verse. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another, and all the more, all the more. Even more importantly, as you see the day, what day? The day of the Lord approaching. So, I don't think between now and the time the Lord returns, we'll see less prayer meetings. I think we're going to see more prayer meetings. Maybe not more worship services, but there's going to be a greater need for us to come together and pray and support one another and pray for a move of God in our homes, our families, in our city to see a great move of God. You know what's interesting about this? The word there, the apostle writing these words is using the word for gathering, gathering, assembling yourselves, gathering. It's the same word that's used by Paul in, in uh, Thessalonians that talks about the rapture when we are gathered together and caught up. It's the same word. Only twice is that word used in the New Testament. The gathering of worship and the gathering up into the clouds to meet Jesus in the air. Worship, when we come to our public gatherings, is a rehearsal for the rapture. Well, I don't want to miss the rapture. I don't think I want to miss being in church. How about you? You say, well, Pastor, now you're really stepping on toes. Well, you know what? I'm just giving you the truth of what it says here in the Bible. And here's what I believe will happen. That even as we see the day of God approaching and the evil continues to grow, because Paul said it would. He said, in the last days are going to be dangerous times. I know we'd all like to be able to sail into heaven. Hey, wow, hallelujah, and it's great to be here, our eternal holiday. Nope, we're going to have to fight our way into heaven. We're going to have some struggles along the way, but we're going to fight on our knees in prayer. Amen? And we may have to do it more and more. You know what happened when we... Uh, we got into a, uh, a time of prayer the first week in January in uh, 1996. And we had a wonderful church. We had, we had 100 kids in our youth group. We had a youth pastor. We had several full-time employees, five full-time pastors. We, we, had, we had wonderful ministry going. But I wasn't satisfied because we weren't seeing the power that we need to see in our ministry. People were getting saved. People were being added to the church. We were raising money. We built a new family life center. All those things that pastors like to do and churches like to brag about. You know, all those things. And, uh, but my heart 
says, I'm not satisfied with this. I, I, we're not seeing New Testament Pentecost really activated, signs and wonders. And so normally every year at the beginning of January, we prayed for a week. We'd have a week of prayer and fasting every year. Assemblies of God churches do that around the country. I did it when we were in Rome. They're still doing it there. They have twice a year, they have a week of prayer and fasting in that church. And uh, we got through the, the, uh, the first week of prayer. We got to Friday night, and I was struggling with fasting. I was struggling in, in my prayer, but I was hungry for a move of God. And there weren't uh, that many people attending those prayer meetings. I, you know, uh, maybe... 25 or 30, but we weren't having any great crowds, but we just prayed on through, prayed on through. Our staff was praying during the day, and every night at the church we had prayer meeting. On Friday night, God spoke to my heart, and the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, I want you to tell these people tonight in this prayer meeting that on Sunday night you're going to preach on divine healing, and I'm going to heal some people. Now, listen, I'd never had that happen in my life. I was 40-some years old, and I'd been in ministry and planted churches and been a missionary, but I'd never had that happen. So Loretta remembers being there. On that Friday night, I stopped the prayer meeting. I said, I just want to tell you all something. Uh, I just heard from the Lord, and I'm going to preach on divine healing on Sunday night, and God's going to heal people in this church. And we started praying again. Sunday morning, we had a great crowd, lots of people there. Church was full. I preached. Sun I told the church on Sunday morning, tonight I'm preaching on divine healing, and God's going to heal some people. Now, uh, that, I was walking out on a limb right there. What if nobody gets healed? Then, then I haven't heard from God. Come on, let me tell you that, you know, I mean, I'm putting a word out there, and it's like, whoa, that limb's going to get sawed off if you're not careful. And you know what happened on Sunday night when I finished? God began to move. We anointed people with oil. Five people got healed that night, and one of them was a guy who worked in a steel mill. He was a foreman in a steel mill, and he couldn't hardly walk. His knees were so bad from the years of work, and he was going to have to have surgery on both of his knees to rebuild his kneecaps. I mean, a guy could hardly walk. He's a good friend of mine. We, we go fishing together. He couldn't hardly sit in a fishing boat because of the pain in his knees. And that night, God healed him, and he weighed about 240 pounds. And we saw Don come up on the platform, jumping. I mean, that guy was jumping up and down like a Maasai warrior in Kenya. He jumped, he leaped, he ran across the platform and threw his arms up in the air and said, I'm healed, I'm healed. God Almighty, I am healed. And he was. From that point on, he never needed any more attention to his needs. Still a friend of mine today. Four other people were healed that night. One lady who just had surgery, she fell on the ice. It was in the middle of the wintertime. And she, she had fallen on the ice and shattered her lower arm. She was uh, in her 70s. And they, the doctors tried to rebuild her arm, and they had this cast on there, and she was in such pain and, and, and everything. But, but her, her, her hand was like this. She couldn't, she couldn't close her hand. Her hand was just like this. And the doctor said, well, you know, it may not have worked too good. You, you may have to be like that for the rest of your life. Can you imagine? You can't pick up anything. You can't do hardly anything with your hand. Little old white-haired lady. And we were praying and we were rejoicing about Don getting healed. And she walks up to me at the, at the uh, edge of the platform there at the altar. She said, Pastor, look at this. She held up her hand and she started doing this. Just like that. She said, Pastor, Jesus healed me while we were praying. It was amazing. Three other people were healed that night. Amazing. Where did it start? In a prayer meeting. We didn't have a guest preacher. We didn't have a, a world-renowned preacher selling books and tapes and CDs. We didn't have any of that stuff going on. We just had a prayer meeting. And God spoke in a prayer meeting. And in the worship service, things began to happen. That's when revival began to happen. And it all started when God's people gathered together and expected the power of prayer to bring victories. Hallelujah. Amazing. I'd like for the servers to come. We're going to take communion together. We can do this rather quickly here at the end. Here's what I believe 
my friends, I really believe this. We are in the last days and we are in very, very difficult times. Let me ask you this. If a year ago, if somebody would said to you, you know, next year we're going to have groceries all around the room in our, in our, in our sanctuary here and, and boxes are just going to be stacked up so we can feed people. Really? Would you have believed that? Or would you have thought, you know, that guy's nuts. What does he think? None of us expected that, did we? But look around. We got all this food packed up over here. We got it back in the back room. People are coming to the door of this church every week, two days a week, to pick up food, boxes of food. They're hungry. We never thought anything like that was going to happen. You can just kind of throw those things out the window in your mind because we don't know. We live on the edge of eternity. We live on the edge of the future today, and we don't have any idea what's coming. But we do know from what the Word of God tells us that in the last days, there are going to be struggles. And believe it or not, there's going to be persecution. Can I tell you this? Through this pandemic, governments have found a way to try to shut down churches and to shut down Christianity. You know what? It's happening. So we may have to get together more and more like Hebrews 10 said, even more as you see the day approaching. Come together and pray. What do we do when we pray? We pray in the name of Jesus. Why? Because there's power in the name of Jesus. Why? Because he's the king of kings and lord of lords. He's the only lamb of God who went to the cross. And we're getting ready to remember that through the bread and the juice. He is the only lamb of God who went to the cross to be a savior for all of us, for everybody. You know what? He's, Jesus Christ is a savior for Antifa. He's a savior for all his people that are burning and looting, destroying and shooting and beating up people. He is the savior. He wants to be the savior and the Lord for every one of them. Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? No wonder Jesus said, pray for your enemies. We're going to talk about that next Sunday. No wonder Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for them. Feed them. If your enemy is hungry, give him something. Why? Because Jesus loves your enemies too. Hallelujah. And he went to the cross. And he gave his life, laid his body down. Jesus said, no man takes it from me. I lay it down. And he laid it down for us on the cross. Has everybody been served? Everybody? Okay. All right. On the night Christ, before he was crucified, he celebrated a Passover meal with his disciples, and he took the bread, and he gave it to them, and he gave it a different meaning this time. Not just the usual Passover, but he said, this bread is my body, which is broken for you. Eat in remembrance of me. Let us eat together. Then he took the cup of the fruit of the vine, and he blessed it before the Father. And he gave the wine new meaning. He said, this represents my blood, the blood of a new covenant. Drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink together. Now, will you stand with me? I have one request. Could we pray together? I'm not asking you to hold hands with anybody, but in our hearts, could we pray together? Because there's power when we pray together. There's power when husband and wife join together in a home, and pray together for their home, for their children. There's power. Jesus said where two or more agree, the power of agreement, joining forces, joining faith, agreeing together to pray. There's power when you pray with a friend and you join with a friend. When a friend comes to you and says, Things are not going well. Please pray for me. That's the time right then to pray. Or a neighbor. Hey, we pray with people in our neighborhood. We pray with people who come with the boxes of hope. We've heard some of them from Latin America stand here and tell about all of their families back home that are sick or dead from the virus. And we pray with them right here. Mario prays with them in Spanish. Why? Because it's important that we pray together. 
It's important that we agree. It's important that we come together. It's important that the church realize there's great power when the church prays together. Could we pray? And here's what I want you to pray for. I want you to pray for your church. I want you to pray for us and our pastors and our leadership. I want, to, I want you to pray for us that we will be the church that God has called Highland uh, Assembly of God or Highland Community Church to be, Hope City Ministries. I want you to pray with me. And you know what? That means that 40 or 50 people in this room, we're all praying for the same thing. We're all saying, I want it. I believe it. I'm trusting God for it. God bless our church to be what we need to be. Can we pray that in closing? Let's pray together. Father, we lift our hearts. We lift our voices together. We are here in one place and in one mind. We are here, Lord, to pray for one thing, that you, O oh God, would put your hand upon this group of believers on this corner in Baltimore, O oh God, and bring a greater anointing upon us and a greater faith that grows within us, O oh God, that we might see miracles, that we might see signs and wonders, and that we might boldly go from this place and proclaim your word in this city, not in Jerusalem, but in Baltimore, oh God. Lord, that we might see many souls come to you and see victory in the lives of your people, oh God. In the name of Jesus, we pray, make us, Lord, what we need to be as a powerful prayer force. For the kingdom of God, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you.